attention in a way because I did this demo game in VR. So I got this because I straight away made this game and I straight away demo in front of the them. So they tried it out. So, so I, the idea is to have an explosion on the, on your left side. But the thing is, when when they fire up, they are looking on the right side. So so this is my problem. How do I direct the attention to the right place? So I started with light first. When you got this light, then they will look over, over the left side. Then when they look over the left side, then the explosion started. That's how I get them notice on it. And then some I I I tried it out with light. I start a fire, but it doesn't really work well for some certain people. Then I decided to add the sound. 3D sound from the left side. That works 100%. Everyone look at the left side as I wish. <laughs> so that's my experience for that. Okay, next one. Sorry, yeah. So um, when it comes to storytelling, so let's exclude interactivity. So let's talk about just viewing a film like cinema, TV, right? Um, don't you think that 360 is redundant? Because I, I'm excited about VR, I've got a car, oh, and I, I really enjoy the photosphere and all that. But I'm not going to turn around here and then, I go to Toronto. And I, I let my mom try something, right? She's excited, and after a while, you don't want to like use this for two hours, you know? More or less, it's about 180 degrees. If you're talking about just doing a story like a, like a cinema kind of way, unless that paradigm changes, I mean, am I making sense? Do you know what I mean? So what, what, what do you think about that? Do you think 360 VR is actually not going to be that big for, um, for like a storytelling? I, I, I think that it's evolving and I think that, that just like some people right, would rather watch something on their computer that they download and some people want the full experience where they are sitting in a theatre and watching stuff. You will have degrees of interaction. I think that the problem now is not that we have too little choice but we have too much. We have a choice where we can be totally immersed in an environment, but if you are totally immersed in an environment, sometimes it's sensory overload. It is too much. Some people don't like it. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's storytelling that has never quite existed before and there are also other differences. You wouldn't believe some of the shit that we had to deal with. Well, okay, I'll teach you. I'll say for that. Anyway, uh, some of the things that we had to deal with, right? It's, you, you perceive in 3D and in, in, uh, in stereoscopic space in a particular way, but do you know that there's a gender difference in how we perceive things as well? So women perceive things in general, okay, I don't want to quote me on this, I'm not being sexist, I'm just being factual, um, differently from, from guys. So they have better peripheral vision. That's why when you go to club and then you stand and then you just mm. then you go <laughs> but she's also looking. <laughs> but she looks it from the side and all the girls do this. They know this. So you look at the girl, right? She does a quick flip. She she locks in and then from the peripheral women's peripheral vision is better. So they can see things like that. That's why if you are dry if you a couple driving, um, the the guy say, Do you see the car coming in? And then the girl says, Yeah, I see, what is calling me for? Because she's looking from the side. And it's very interesting because we realize this when you're doing color grading uh, and other things with uh, in, in 3D because our uh, female color gradings, color graders would see problems in the peripherals of the picture. General 90 to 99% of the time that 80 or 70 or 50% of the time, right, our male color graders would not catch because our guys tend to be focused this hunter-gatherer kind of thing and women tend to be very good at the peripheral side of the, of the vision so if you want to catch your girlfriend looking at a guy's butt in the club you look for the flick to the side and then the focus so the next time she's calling you, you scold her back okay? so this is the this is this is part of the physiology of having to deal with the new medium it's actually very very interesting and with regards to your question I, I really don't know I think that, that I think that okay you know, even in the storytelling, in the early years of filmmaking, the audience could not deal with jump cuts or transitions. So if you look at the first movies that came out in, if you look at film history in 1910 or something, everything was one continuous shot from beginning to end. So the, 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 uh, the, uh, 
actors and the crew were extremely fit. These guys were literally running around for an entire one and a half hours for the length of the movie. Okay? And then slowly, the language of the movie evolved. They started introducing jump cuts. Initially, the audience couldn't deal with it. But then it became a language, a set of conventions that both the audience and the filmmakers agreed to. And I think that what we are here now is we are at the stage where we are developing that language. And that language is going to start um, happening in the next couple of years. It's very interesting times, like I said, but it's also very weird. Now, one of the things that, that, that people do is um, when you shoot 360, right, normally there's a hole at the bottom and a hole at the top. If your cameras can't cover everything, if you've seen any 360 shots, you will see that usually there's like a round hole. And what well, I've seen some companies, what they do is they put their logos there. <laughs> Which is very smart. So they put their logos there, they put logos there. And that also tells you that you're in a VR space. So because if you get too involved in it, then at least you get all oh, It's not entirely real. Oh, and if you think that all these are problems, well, there's a whole lot of other things that you haven't thought of. When you were doing shooting 3D, right, and after you finish the movie, you say, hang on, where do the subtitles go? So if you're shooting in 3D space and you've got multi-language then, in 3D space, we, we had a huge problem because we had to put the subtitles and if the subtitles are put in the wrong place, then the, the, and the guy, if the subtitles are too close, uh, you have to be out in front, right? Then the actors uh, intrude onto that space. Then the whole illusion of, <laughs> of depth disappears. So you, even things, small things like subtitles became a problem. And we are now having to deal with the same thing all over again in 360. Shit. And not only 360, 360 stereo part. You bigger it. It's a, frankly speaking, it's, it's an evolving mess right now. And I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know where it will evolve because I suspect it will be a situation where it depends on how much information you can handle. It also is interesting because there are certain things that will happen in movie making with the advent of digital effects that also bear on this. One of the things was that if you want to do, uh, I can't remember the exact thing now, but if you want to do a particular shot, right, if you, if you, right now you have full control of your 360 environment, especially if it is, it is computer generated. So you can do things where you have more or less detail depending on how much detail your audience's mind can handle. So you can have a scene where it is, there is less noise, there are less things happening if you want them to focus in on one thing, like this gentleman here said earlier, like, you, how do you get them to look in this area? In stereoscopic 3D, right, we found out something very interesting that if we manipulated the image such that uh, you force the eyes to focus on this area, the eyes will focus on this area. And there's a very, uh, there's a stunning uh, example of it which unfortunately I don't have here. But what we did is we showed an audience this frame, this stereoscopic 3D uh, thing, and they all wearing glasses and they watched it. Say, okay, cool. Now you all watch really fine. Okay. Then we said, okay, now watch again and tell us where the errors are. So they watch again. Hey, the crew is in the corner. They're in shot. So you see the camera crew in the corner in shot, but they didn't see it in the 3D shot because what happened is, if you, if you are a good stereographer, what happens is you, 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 the cameras are shooting slightly offset. So they are focusing in on, uh, on a particular object and that object is the one that you are most, com most comfortable watching. So we showed this clip to our audience 100 times. 100 times out of 100, in stereo 3D, they never noticed the crew in shot in the corner never noticed them. Okay. So there are all these tricks that are happening in both VR and 3D that you can use to concentrate your audience's eye in a particular place, which has implications for things like advertising. So if you do a product placement in 3D, in a stereoscopic 3D environment, you could actually, for a woman, focus your eyes on the person's eyes on a particular product or image or whatever you want. And the same applies in VR 3D space. There is, there is all these possibilities happening. And I, as I said, I, I, it's a constant ego. Sorry, I better stop talking about that. Uh, Eugene, do you want to add something? Yeah. Um, uh, next question. Next question. <laughs> there was, yeah. uh, first of all, thank you guys for a pretty fascinating talk. So now we're all very excited about VR here. Um, so a bit more of a general question. I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, where do you guys feel are the, I mean, for those of us in the audience who are aspiring to be more involved or to be in uh, part of the ecosystem, where are, do you see are the business opportunities right now in the ecosystem or where are the areas that are a bit more lacking? Is it in 
content creation? Is it a platform? Is it gaming? Is it marketing? Well, you know, what, what do you guys think? Actually, I'm only here. What do you want to Hello. Oh, uh, yeah, I think the, the main problem is that nobody has the, not everybody has the VR equipment. It's like when I try to make my, my massive multiplayer online game, or online gallery where anybody could log on, uh, most, most people, except for me, logged on uh, just the normal vision. And I was the only one there with the Oculus Rift and, and having, having the time of my life. So I think the main problem is that uh, not many people have it yet. So if you would like to address that problem, it would, it would really save everybody's... <laughs> yeah. It, it would really help all the VR people if, if you manage to get everybody to get equipment. Yeah. I guess one of the solutions is Google Cardboard, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. I'm going to come to Block 71. <laughs> yeah, he promised me a Google Cardboard to, to work my my game, but I haven't got it from him yet. Uh, <laughs> Actually, uh, in terms of business opportunities, I think the best one right now, if you want to go into it, is gaming. Because VR gaming has been growing slowly but steadily. Anything else? Uh, right now, some of the few things I've seen that people really seem to get into are sort of when you tell individual stories. When you tell certain experiences that uh, often you can combine with you know, sensory perception and a lot of other things that people really seem to enjoy. Because uh, movie watching, I think, for the most part, for a lot of people, is a very passive experience. You just like to sit down with some popcorn and you want to watch something on a TV. But a lot of people seem to be going for these really experience sort of, um, I don't even know what to call it yet, uh, where you have the outdoors or you have a certain experience, certain kind of activity that you never do yourself, and you want to look around. You want to be in there, you want to feel yourself inserted into that environment. It's not a story being told, it's you just simply looking around and actually experiencing what the person wearing it was experiencing at that time. That I think would definitely has potential because you don't have a lot of problems that uh, movies have right now. Um, sure. Actually, one of the areas where I think that we are, where I tried um, VR experiences for concerts. So one of the things that I saw was somebody did a VR thing with uh, uh, one of the groups, I forgot which one. Yeah, the, today you know that I'm not thinking very straight. Uh, so imagine a Taylor Swift concert and somebody, a VR camera in front, and that means you're front and center in, in an audience with the audience at the back of you. And uh, so I mean, we actually, we actually, uh, who sang La Vida La Di? La... Coldplay. Yeah, so we, we did like, I saw the one that was a Coldplay concert in 3D and it was great because you are literally in front of the band, you know, watching them and then looking behind you and seeing the audience. But in this case, I think that because they had only two cameras, stereoscopic or three cameras in front, when you look behind you, suddenly you see the logo of the company that did the VR show. <laughs> logo, band. <laughs> then behind the logo. Okay. You know, but that's a very valid application. I think that a lot of people would love that to actually uh, front front and centre, you know, you, you go to a concert, even if you pay like 200 300 dollars if you're really lucky, you might be like 10 to 20 seats deep from the front of the, the band. But to be able to, to be right there in front of them, and uh, yeah, that, that would work. So uh, there, there are, I think that there are tons of commercial applications. So uh, uh, you, why, don't you why don't you explain why Facebook bought Oculus? That would be the interesting example, I think. In order to understand what's the commercial, you have to understand why did Facebook buy Oculus? Did anybody think about this? Uh, I'm not sure why I should answer that question. Yes, answer. <laughs> um, well, technically, what they, what they want to do is uh, hook it up with a massive multiplayer game. So, like in, like in virtual reality, interactive, worldwide. 
that's, that's the gist of this. So I think uh, when we look at virtual reality, uh, you will have a lot of things that go massively into the game area, which makes sense because game right now is uh, the biggest revenue-driven medium that's out there. It's, I think uh, the revenue just of games is the same amount, or is more than the amount of all the other media combined right now. So it makes sense. Any other questions? Yes, sorry. Next one. After hearing like, a lot of that, I heard like this looks like a lot of people have different preferences when looking at VR or even stereotypical vision in general. Like is that even a possibility that it could be more of a personalized experience? Like is, instead of like making it for all, making it just something that's adjustable, like a system, more of a software thing, yeah. just for a personal yeah. personal yeah. person instead of like for all, you know, because everybody has so much difference. So it's like something that's um, easy for someone to accept because I'm sure like um, as a person who's like new to VR or something, like I don't get how the system works, so I need to research on how the system works. But what if it is user friendly to see that okay I can adjust this to my own preferences before everything starts in the first place, wouldn't it be easier for people to accept in general? I think that's one he already did with the with the roller coaster. That's like personal personal ride, right? Uh, uh yes I know. You have to try it then also. I didn't try that one. Yeah, they they don't know. Oh. Hello testing. Um okay. so you'll take care of the why it won't. Um was it Mutuha? Um what do you think? I think that the whole point of VR is that it is a personal experience. But what I think you're asking is how much more can that experience be personalized? And the answer is quite a lot. Now, what we're experimenting with now is we're shooting 360 with six cameras, each running at 6K resolution. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's a lot of data. So we are running, uh, if you don't know what they are, they are the epic dragons. Uh, they are the ones that we use for shoots like uh, Lord of Lord of Rings, Hobbit, that kind of thing. And um, the idea of, the, okay, we don't need to do that. You can actually go out there and print your own 3D rig, your 360 rig. Uh, you can go download the design on the internet and you can print it. I did it. It cost me $300, but that was when you print your know, printers. But, and then you just buy six, uh, uh, six of those GoPro cameras and you stick them in. You hook them up via USB so that they are all syncing together. And you must know what you're doing with this because again, if one of the cameras doesn't sync, right? There's a frame offset. That's going to mess up your image. So you must know how to set up the cameras to shoot 360. Um, you, you can do that. But we're doing it at such high resolution because you want the ability to be able to move within that space. So you must be able to map everything. So as you go closer to something, right, you don't lose resolution. And, and so there, there are two things. And Facebook just recently bought another company, if I'm not wrong. Either Facebook or Google did. And this was a company in the UK where, uh, where what they would do is they would allow you to not map. You can take a video of this 360 space, but this company had another layer where they took a depth map of that 360 space. Okay, so what, what happens is that, okay, I... I have a grayscale map, and this is something that we saw in evidence like many years ago because we were looking for the same technology because we want to be able to determine how deep this room is and uh, how, uh, how far an object is. So if you have a 3D, 360 map and then you overlay on top of that a, 3, a depth map, you know exactly how far this, this person, this object is. So if you move forward and move around, you know that you're going to hit this person because this person is, is not flat with depth. So you go this far and pow, you hit this, hit this person. So that's why the depth map is important. So when they start doing this right, then everything, even the 360 live shoots become interactive because you can move within that space. And it's, uh, it's well on its way actually. I think that it's, it's, it's going to be here probably in time for the launch of the major headsets in about what, end of, the, end of this year, beginning next year, when is Oculus commercial? Early next year. Early next year. Yeah, by that time, I think that you'll see a lot of this starting to happen. We're already experimenting with the, the depth space thing, um, but we're doing it post. So we shoot something in 360, 
and then it goes to the uh, software team, the software team looks at it and then works out uh, what the different depths are of different objects. By the way, interesting fact, we are monkeys, first and foremost. So our depth perception, right, we cannot really tell how deep or how far objects are beyond 30 meters. So you actually, or everything is, you just need to know how far things are within 30 meters or maybe 50 meters if you want to extend it a bit, then everything beyond that becomes infinity already because uh, as monkeys we were evolved in trees, it's, we can only tell that to the distance which we can throw an object or we can jump from point to point, from a tree to tree, that's it. That's the monkey part of us working out, which is why Avatar worked because it was set in the jungle. Think about that. Very smart. <laughs> Uh, on the game developer, so I've been trying to give of a uh, interactive stuff, but the, the, like the point you all raised about the VR set itself is already very inaccessible to a lot of users. So on top of that, the problem faced for game developers is how do you support more kinds of controls for the users? So one thing I've tried is with the Bluetooth, uh, the Bluetooth controller, even that, that is not very standardized, there's like five different modes of Bluetooth controller settings then uh, there's actually even less people who has the headset as well as a Bluetooth controller. So I've tried things like voice commands using a microphone on the phone. Uh, there's also now other developers that are using uh, lip motion combined with the headset. And I think uh, Oculus having this freeze band control thing as well. So uh, have you all come across any other kind of controls and like which controls do you think has uh, more potential going forward to be uh, sort of like taken uh, by the users? Uh, something that was used a uh, long time ago but uh, has since disappeared are 3D mice. Like, they used to have these little balls and they, they were called 3D mice and you could manipulate them in space but eventually it moved on to gesture control and other kind of stuff. But I've used most of these things and for me the most natural one was holding an object and manipulating it rather than using my hands or using voice control because when you stop paying attention, you start doing other things with your hands and that immediately messes things up entirely. But when you're holding something, you automatically have that perception of what it is and it's very easy to render in 3D space. So that was something that I, I don't exactly know why it disappeared. Maybe it was because it got eclipsed by you know all the new technologies. But I think that was one of the most comfortable things for me in interacting with games in VR and 3D or just 360 space. Hello. Oh, um, and I think I, I tried a lot of that just for mobile, and you know the mobile just doesn't come with anything else. So when I did mobile and with the uh, pretending that I have the uh, Google Cardboard which I've yet to see <laughs> because the, the, the guy doesn't hold anything else and I do not want him to so what I used was the accelerometer when he leaned forward, he walked forward when he leaned back, he walked backwards so, uh, so basically like I have a little th threshold where he can look up and down without moving forward but when he leaned all the way forward then he walked forward so that was my solution to working without any add-ons yeah I think oh, maybe that's like my, my weak solution but I believe in the future the phone would have something else to, that, that, that will help us um. For me, my solution is a little bit different from you. So, how how do a person walk? He look down, down there. There's a there's a something. So, some kind of spear or something like that. Then you look at it. Then you turn like a like a loading bar or something like that. Then after it finish, then you will walk. So that's my solution. So and then uh, there's another way that one of the, one of the other guy thought of is this. As a meter, you do this and then you walk. <laughs> right, so there's a lot of new UX around this. So uh, a lot of interesting things can be done. Some, some people even use watch. So imagine the VR world, you got this guy that walks like this and then with a, with a wrist on, 
in front of you. So you look at that, there's a menu there that walk, okay, walk. <laughs> Stuff like that. So a lot of, by, because like you said, there's no standardized gamepad yet. So there's a lot of different, <laughs> I face a lot of issues with that. So, so I guess just use the loop UI, I would say. Yeah, it's the best solution now. Until Oculus Touch come up with, the, the, the thing that you mentioned is Oculus Touch. So the idea is you can do thumbs up and all this kind of thing accurately, not like lane motion. My friend tried it out, it's verified, I think. <laughs> all right, that's all for me. Okay, last question. Detection for mobile VR. Yeah. Question: What do you believe this technology has the opportunity? Oh, okay. Or can I think that's one for you. <laughs> okay. Um, we have we have tested this before, and it is possible to use. You to, okay, because what we've done is uh, we have had to use various different uh, pieces of hardware together with the Oculus Rift. So we've had to tie different technologies together. So it is possible to tie a Kinect kind of technology together with the Oculus Rift and you can put controllers in a room and you can have multiple people walking around uh, interacting with each other and create the virtual... The, the, the idea of the, the, the Star Trek follow that, it's, it's very possible. We, we haven't actually done it yet. We know we can do it, but we haven't done it yet because nobody wants to pay us to do it. And uh, we, we don't, um, we, you know, it, we, we have a commercial imperative. We will do it if we, uh, we can cover the cost, basically. Um, but for, it has to be in a space that is controlled. That means you have to put your controllers somewhere in the room so that they can take multiple people walking around. And the software, as far as I know, based on what my programmers and engineers and the people I've talked to tell me, is good enough to be able to detect within a certain space four or five separate people. Now, the interesting question is how fine is the detection? Can they detect if they're raising their arm, you know, they're throwing something, or they're pretending to throw something? If they so these are the questions I don't know yet. These are the things that we would have to test to find out. And also it depends on the controllers. Because uh, can, uh, the Kinect controllers uh, are fine, uh, but I think also that they're being phased out and there are different controllers coming on market that have even finer resolution. So there's a lot of... The, the technology is changing from day to day. It is so fast even we can't keep up. So we, you know, new controllers keep coming online. Uh, even for us, uh, when we first started using the Oculus, even now, we don't think it's good enough. We think that the Oculus will only actually reach some real maturity when the screens can go to 4K. Right now, they are the highest resolution you can get on an Oculus Crystal K is, I think, HD right, 1920 by 1080. And the, actually, the highest resolution you can get is on your Samsung phone because it's 256 something, if I'm not wrong. It's the same panel. No, it's a different one. No, the, the old Oculus was the same panel as the Samsung phone. You, it's exactly the same panel. That they sold from there. I don't know what the new one. Okay. I think the new one I was told is too far, but uh, that's uh, you know. 
So the the and for us, um, if you want to pay for a certain amount, you can get an Oculus Rift. But we were at, at one point we were not we were so dissatisfied that we were considering building our own headsets because it's not very difficult now. It's not all the pieces are there. You know, all the same things you use in the, on a helicopter to determine the the, the distance. But it's all it's all there. The only issue is trying to find a screen that is 4K resolution. But when it comes out, it's certain that what will happen is Oculus will come out with a second version of their or somebody will come out with a second version of their. Uh, 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 headset that is going to be 4K. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I think that concludes our meetup today. Uh, thanks for the speakers. Big thanks to the Zendesk for watching us today. And yeah, now we.